In the last video, we learned about linear dependence and linear independence. We saw that linear independence is a useful property for our spanning sets to have, so we called a linearly independent spanning set a basis. In the process of learning all of this, things have gotten increasingly abstract. Is there any practical application for any of this? That is what we will answer in this video. This video is a part of From Zero to Geo, a series where we formulate geometric algebra, an incredibly powerful branch of mathematics, from the ground up. Do you remember why we looked at things like spans and bases in the first place? The reason was to be able to describe any vector in a space in terms of a few vectors. For example, let's say we started with these two vectors, which are a basis for the plane. With them, we can write any other vector in the plane as a linear combination of our basis vectors. But now notice that no other linear combination of x hat and y hat will reach v. If you think about it, this should make sense. The coefficient of x hat must be how far to the right the vector goes, and the coefficient of y hat must be how far up the vector goes. Thus, the coefficients of x hat and y hat are unique when trying to reach other vectors. It's important to realize that this is not always the case. Let's consider starting with these vectors. To write this same vector in terms of those vectors, we could use these coefficients. However, unlike before, there are other coefficients that we could use to reach the vector. In fact, there are plenty of coefficients we could use to make this work. What is it about x hat and y hat that allowed us to have unique coefficients for each vector? You might think that it's because they are perpendicular, but consider these vectors. They span the plane, so it's possible to write this vector as a linear combination of the two. But are the coefficients unique? Well, let's first consider just using v. With just v, all we can do is reach points along this line. Now think about if we set the coefficient of u equal to 1. Then, when we scale v, we can only reach points along this line. Notice that in the end, all that using u did was shift this line down a bit. Now as we scale u, this line will keep moving so that it goes through the end of u. So to reach w, we need to find a value for the coefficient of u such that the line passes through the end of w. Notice that the only possible value that does this is negative 1.5. Now we need to find a value for the coefficient of v such that the linear combination is equal to w. At this point, the only possible value that does this is negative 3. So we see that the coefficients of u and v must be negative 1.5 and negative 3. Thus, the coefficients are still unique in this case, and the vectors being perpendicular was not necessary. So what's the condition to make the coefficients unique? Well, let's think about where this argument fails with these vectors. Without w, the span of x hat and y hat is the whole plane. If we start to think about using w, notice that changing the coefficient of w doesn't really change what vectors we can reach. Thus, we could set the coefficient of w to pretty much anything we want, showing that the coefficient is not unique. So the difference between these two sets of vectors is that on the left, Scaling one of the vectors moved the span of the other vectors around, while on the right, scaling one of the vectors did not move the span of the other vectors around. If you think about it, this is because on the left, none of the vectors are in the span of the other vectors, while on the right, one of the vectors is in the span of the other vectors. Wait a minute. This is precisely the definition of linear dependence and linear independence that we found in the previous video. So it seems that the coefficients being unique is tied to linear independence. Let's take a look at a more complicated example to try to verify this connection. Let's take a look at these three vectors. You might not be able to tell, but these three vectors are linearly independent and span all of three-dimensional space. Let's now consider this new vector. It is possible to write A as a linear combination of u, v, and w, but are these coefficients unique? Notice that the span of u and v is this plane. Without w, this is the only region we can reach. But with w, we can reach many more vectors. It's a bit hard to see the plane moving around at the moment, so let's change the camera angle slightly. Now as we scale w, we'll be moving the span of u and v around. 
we can see that the only way we can reach a is by setting the coefficient of w to 2. No other scalar will work, so we see that the coefficient of w is unique. Notice that in this argument, we utilize the fact that w is not in the span of the other vectors. Thus, we see that the coefficient of w is unique when it is not in the span of the other vectors. In addition, there's no reason that we had to use w in this argument. We could have used u or v in this argument as well to show that the coefficient of u or v is unique when they are not in the span of the other vectors. Together, we see that all of the coefficients are unique when none of the vectors are in the span of the other vectors. As expected, this is precisely the definition of linear independence. This fact has a very important consequence. Consider some basis S. Remember that this means that the set S spans all of space and that S is linearly independent. The first statement means that every vector can be written as a linear combination of vectors in S, and we've seen now that the second statement implies that in these linear combinations, the coefficients are unique. Together, these statements say that every vector can be written in exactly one way as a linear combination of vectors in S. This statement here is incredibly useful. It allows us to describe any vector in a purely algebraic way, which at times can be much more efficient than describing vectors geometrically. For example, as we've seen, to describe vectors in two-dimensional space, all we have to do is pick some set of vectors, say this one, that spans the plane. Because these two vectors are a basis for the plane, when we write another vector as the linear combination of them, we know that these coefficients uniquely correspond to this vector. We call these unique coefficients the components of the vector in that basis. Using this terminology, in the basis containing x hat and y hat, the components of v are 3 and 2. Because the components of the vector uniquely determine the vector, we could forget about the geometry of the situation entirely and just manipulate this expression. In fact, because of this correspondence between vectors and their components, some people consider vectors to simply be their components. When doing this, they define vectors as just a list of numbers, which they usually write as a list in angle brackets or in a column. While writing vectors in this way can be efficient, especially when computing, it is a dangerous practice for one simple reason. Vectors are not lists of numbers. Not only is this idea unhelpful in many situations, we will see in the next video that it is just plain wrong. In most applications, we want to think of a vector as a geometric object, not as a list of numbers. Now, some people say that because there is a correspondence between arrows and lists of numbers, it's fine to just define vectors as a list of numbers and then use this correspondence in applications. But there's a problem with this approach. The components of a vector can change. While it is true that in a particular basis, the components of a vector are unique, if we switch to another basis, the components are different. In terms of x hat and y hat, the components of w are 3 and 2, while in terms of u and v, the components of w are 1 and 1. Now, some people would just say to forget about the other bases and always stick with one particular basis. But there are many applications where we want to use other bases, sometimes even several bases at once. It's impossible to always use one single basis, so it's better to think of vectors as fundamentally being geometric objects rather than lists of numbers. Another point against this particular notation of representing vectors as a list of numbers is that this notation doesn't work very well in geometric algebra. We will see in Chapter 2 that vectors are actually part of a larger class of objects called multivectors, and it is much more cumbersome to represent multivectors using lists of numbers. However, with all of this said, the idea of using components to manipulate vectors is useful, as long as you are explicit about what basis you are using. At times, the problem at hand leads us to use a particular basis, but there are many situations where we can use whatever basis we wish. So what basis should we use by default? Well, consider a basis like this. It would be very annoying to use for several reasons. First, it is much easier to figure out how to write a vector as a linear combination of other vectors when the other vectors are perpendicular. So we would want all of the vectors in our basis to be perpendicular. When we have a basis where each vector is perpendicular to every other vector, we call that basis an orthogonal basis. Now, because we often scale the vectors in our bases, it can be helpful to have basis vectors with a length of 1.
Recall that the process of changing the length of a vector to 1 is called normalizing the vector, so another thing that makes for a good basis is to have normalized vectors. When we have an orthogonal basis where each vector is normalized, we call that basis an orthonormal basis. Finally, it can be helpful to have our basis vectors aligned with the coordinate axes. There is only one basis that satisfies all of these conditions, and we call it the standard basis. One useful fact about the standard basis is that when we have a vector that starts at the origin, its components in the standard basis are precisely the coordinates of the endpoint of the vector. Now the standard basis is important enough that I want to talk a bit about the notation that we use for it. There are many different conventions for what we call these vectors. Because they are unit vectors pointing in the x and y directions, people often call them x hat and y hat like I have been doing. If we were working in three dimensions, we would call the unit vector along the z axis z hat. Another common convention is to use i hat, j hat, and k hat for the x, y, and z basis vectors. However, there's another convention that is often used by people doing geometric algebra, which is to call the standard basis vectors e1, e2, and e3. The reason for this notation is that it generalizes better to different situations and it is more convenient in geometric algebra. Thus, even though I've been using x hat, y hat, and z hat until now, from now on I will be using this convention instead. Another note I want to make about this convention is that it breaks the rule of always putting an arrow above a vector. The reason for breaking this rule here is that we will later generalize this notation to things that aren't vectors, and we don't want to use vector notation for those things. From now on, when I have the letter E with a subscript, it will always refer to an element of the standard basis, even though it has no vector arrow. Alright, enough of this abstract nonsense. Let's do some practical exercises. Let u and v be vectors given by these components. Please calculate this linear combination. This problem is actually quite straightforward. All we have to do is take the expression, substitute the definition of u and v, and simplify. So we see that the answer is 3e1 minus 2e2. Notice how much more work this problem would have been before we knew about components. We would have had to draw a coordinate plane, draw the vectors, scale the vectors, and then add them. Drawing all of this out and counting units and such is significantly more time consuming than just calculating this result algebraically. Using these ideas, we can also develop general algorithms for vector operations. For example, if we have an arbitrary vector and want to multiply it by some scalar b, by distributing, we see that to multiply a vector by a scalar, all we need to do is multiply the components by that scalar. Similarly, if we have two vectors and want to add them, by factoring we see that to add two vectors, all we need to do is add their components. These two rules are very useful and apply to any basis. Is there a similar formula for the length of a vector? Let's look at the two-dimensional case first. We saw in a previous video that to find the length of a vector, we can draw a right triangle and use the Pythagorean theorem. Now notice that the length of these two lines is precisely the length of these two vectors, which are just a e1 and b e2. We can now use the Pythagorean theorem to relate the lengths of these three vectors. Now the two vectors on the right hand side are along the axes, so their length squared is easy to calculate. They are simply the components squared. At this point, we can just take the square root of both sides. Thus, this is the formula for the length of a two-dimensional vector. But now what about a three-dimensional vector? Is there an analogous formula for the length of a three-dimensional vector? If you haven't seen this before, it's an interesting exercise to try to figure it out for yourself. So if you don't know the answer, please pause the video now and try to find the formula for the length of a three-dimensional vector. Like in the two-dimensional case, let's start with a general 3D vector given by this expression. We can draw this vector as the sum of three other vectors, AE1, BE2, and CE3. As it stands now, we can't use the Pythagorean theorem to find the length. However, notice that the vector is the hypotenuse of this right triangle. Let's call the length of this line D. But by the Pythagorean theorem, we know that the total length of the vector squared is d squared plus the length of c e 3 squared. 
Notice that D itself is the hypotenuse of its own right triangle, so by the Pythagorean theorem, D squared is the length of AE1 squared plus the length of BE2 squared. Now like before, because the vectors are along the axes, all of these expressions on the right-hand side are simply the components squared. As in the two-dimensional case, all we need to do now is just take the square root of both sides. Thus, this is the formula for the length of a three-dimensional vector. You might notice that it's pretty similar to the formula for the length of a two-dimensional vector. In general, in an orthonormal basis, the length of a vector is the square root of the sum of the components squared. Now that we have components, it is much easier for me to give computational exercises. Because these basic operations are so useful, it is important to have a lot of experience calculating them. Thus, here are several exercises that you should do. Because they are simple problems, I'm not going to be going through the solutions. Instead, I'll just show the answers in a moment. If you don't want the answer spoiled, pause the video now. In this video, we have seen that while we usually think of vectors as arrows, we can also think of vectors in terms of components. While there is a relationship between the two, these two concepts are quite different from each other on the face of it. Could there be other things that are also related to vectors in some way? We will explore this idea in the next video, and it will lead us to a radically different answer to the question, what is a vector?